Okay, next on task number two with DNS ALG, we need to enable DNS lookup on R1 to use the Window 2008 DNS server. And then we need to verify reachability to R2 loopback 0 using the name of r2l0.labminutes.com. Then we're going to look at the Wireshark capture of DNS packets. And then we're trying to disable DNS ALG and then retry. Okay, so by default, the router has the DNS ALG or application level gateway features enabled. So all we need to do since we have all the NAT translation in place already. On R3, let's make sure that we can still ping our DNS server on the outside, right here, 172.16.12.32, but R3 needs to refer to that using IPv6, and we have already created a translation, which is 2001.2.0.0.1. So let's try to ping that IP, 2001.2.1, one, sourcing from loopback1. You can see that's reachable, so we should be able to go ahead and enable domain lookup with the command IP domain lookup. And then make sure we have a lookup sourcing from loopback1 interface. And then configuring the name server, which is 2001 2001. Sorry, it's uh, IP name. Okay, now let's go back on to our Wireshark machine. Let's restart that, so continue without saving. And then from R3, we can just go ahead and ping R2 loopback0 dot labminutes.com sourcing from loopback1. Looks like I might have a typo right here, com sourcing1. There you go, you can see that we have a successful ping, all five of them. See how the name r 2 loopback 0 labminutescom gets translated automatically to 2122. You can see we have successful ping, but if you're trying to ping R2 and then L1, which is the loopback one on R2, which we do not have a NAT translation for, and enter, you can see that we do not get any reply back, and we will look at the Wireshark packet and see what is actually happening. Okay, so now Let's go back to our Wireshark machine right here and let's stop that. Scroll up. You can see here this is the request that's coming from R3 the first time you tried with the typo. As you can see right here with the domain name query, you can see it has the correct name with the .com SO. That's why we did not receive any reply back. And let's scroll down to the one that we did properly. Let's see if we can find it. That should be just right before the ICMP. So right here. And this is captured on the outside interface of the R1, which is IPv4, with the source of 33033 to 172.16.12.32, which is a DNS server. And here within the query, we have R2L0, that means .com. Although the first time it's specified as the quad A record, and then right after we have just the regular A record. You can see how the DNS server replied with the quad A, but without any IPs because the DNS server is not configured to contain the quad A record for that particular name. But if you look at the one for the A record, you can see we have an answer right here. And the IP is coming back as 172.16.02, which is the IPv4 address of the R2 loopback 0 interface. But once it crosses the R1, you can see right here the source is translated back to 2001.21, going towards 2001.33. And here the DNS payload or the reply itself from a record becomes a quad a record and the ip is also from 172.16.02 has become 2001.22 since we have the static v4 v6 nat translation configuration on r1 it knows exactly what ip needs to be translated back to within the dns payload okay and then later on we try it again with the r1 l1 as you can see the DNS reply does not contain any answer. Actually for IPv4, it did answer right here, which is 1121, but since the R1 does not have a translation configured for that, you can see there's no packet that's coming out of R1 going back to R3, like we saw earlier for the R2 loopback zero. Okay, so next we're gonna try to disable the DNS uh, ALG feature, and the way to do that is the command no IPv6 NAT, service and dns okay so now that we have the feature disabled we can try to ping r2l0 one more time 
it might still go through. Let me see. There you go. Looks like it didn't because sometimes it catches it. If you do show hose, let's make sure it's a uh, clear hose just to make sure that's gone. Clear hose all. Uh, or actually clear hose and then start. And if you show hose, it's no longer there. And if you're trying to ping, you can see it's failing to resolve that now. And then if you put that command back, which is IPv6 NAT service DNS, and you're trying to ping one more time on R3, you can see the ping is going through again. Okay, so since the feature is disabled by default, there's not much for you to worry about it. And you probably don't really need to disable it either, unless you have a reason to. So that would complete our task number two. Now with task number three, NAT PT with IPv4 mapped. So what we are going to be doing here, as you can see earlier, if we need to configure a static v4 to v6 NAT for all of your IPv4 addresses, it will definitely going to be impractical. So what the IPv4 mapped features allows you to do is to come up with the prefix for IPv6 that represent your whole IPv4 network. And it will know which IPv4 to translate it to because it's going to have the IPv4 embedded, obviously, in the hexadecimal format within the IPv6 IPs. So you can see right here in this diagram, the router know how to use the last 32-bit automatically and have that translated to the IPv4 as long as it has the IPv6 prefix is specified in the configurations. For example, with the RT loopback 0, 172.16.02, that will be in hexadecimal format is AC10 and then 2. So the router will be able to extract this information and then translate it back to the IPv4. And same things goes with right here as an example, 1121, it becomes 101201. So this way you can just do the configuration one time and then it will automatically take care of the translation for all of your IPv4 address spaces. Okay, this is very similar to stateless NAT64, or 46 rather since we're going from 4 to 6. So if you know about the stateless NAT 64 or 46, you will see the concept is very much the same and it pretty much accomplished the same goal. Okay, so for our task, we need to configure R1 to automatically translate an IPv6 destination address with prefix 2122-96 to the corresponding embedded IPv4 address. So R3 loopback 1, 2, and 3 should be able to reach R2 loopback 0 and 1. And then we're going to come back and test our DNS ALLG one more time, but we need to update our DNS server to reflect the new translation. And then we're going to try to reach it by name with R2L0 and then R2L1. And we are allowed to remove any previously configured command as necessary since uh, now we're going from the regular NATPT to the IPv4 map. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is to remove the v4 to v6 command. So we do show run v4. V6. See we have two of these, so let's go ahead and remove them. And the concept of matching interesting traffic to perform NAT translations still exists, but for IPv4 map we need to come up with a access list. So IPv6 access list, we're going to call it v4 map. And then we're going to permit IPv6 source coming from any since we don't really care what source IP is coming from but for destination we want to make sure we are watching for 2122 which is the IPv6 prefix that we need to use to perform our translation and then before I do the next command I want to show you with the for the NAT prefix so from the previous task we have the NAT prefix configured to monitor for 2012 that obviously needs to be changed and if you actually do a command that we need, which is IPv6 NAT prefix. So to replace, I'm just going to get out of that. And then IPv6 NAT prefix, instead of 2012, it has to become 2012.96. And instead of pressing enter, if you do question mark, you'll see an option for v4 map. And then you need to type that back to the access list we just created right here. Okay, so, so it's almost like a double matching at this point since you specify your destination subnet or prefix right here as well as right here within the ACL. Okay, enter. And then if you do show run and then include NAT prefix, 
you can see that the second IPv6 NAT prefix command actually override the first one. So you can't really have both active at the same time. It has to be one or the other. So now that we have the configuration in place, you can see it's fairly straightforward. So as soon as we've done this, we can go back to R3 and then trying to ping. So the first one we're going to try is, let's see, the diagram right here is R2 loopback1, which is this IP right here, 101201. So ping 201221, 101201. Sourcing from loopback1, let's just do repeat of one. And you can see that's pingable. And if we hop on to R1, you can see the source is translated the same way that we configured it previously, but the destination now you can see those embedded IPv4 addresses, 2128.2.101.201, get translated to 1121. Okay, and the same way with R2, R2 is still seeing the source IP is coming from 33033, so that doesn't really change. It's only the destination or the v4, v6 mapped that got changed. Okay, so just to prove that that should work for all of our existing NAT that we have, there's dynamic NAT, which is loopback2, or PAT, which is loopback3. You can see they can still all ping R2 right here. So that's for dynamic net and that's for PAT. So next let's try telnet command. So telnet 2001, 22, 101, 201, sourcing from loopback 1. Okay, go ahead and lock in. Now we be able to hit R2. Now you can see debug is pretty much the same. And now if you do show IPv6 net translation, See, so way up here with 2001.33, translated to 33033, and then 2001.22.101.201 gets translated to 1.1.2.1, and again, it's maintained the state, so it's not so much of stateless, although it's still maintained the state for both IPs and TCPs and protocols and port number. Okay, so next let's try the R2 loopback 0, which is 162.16.02, and the corresponding IPv6 IP is 2001.22 AC10.2. So in R3, if we ping 2001.22, actually, let me get out of that. Ping 2001.22, AC10.2, sourcing from loopback1, repeat1. There should be double colon right there. You can see this pingable as well. Okay, source coming from 33033 and then hitting R2, loopback0. And using this translation method, it still allow for bidirectional traffic initiation. So now from R2, if you ping back to 33033, sourcing from loopback 0, let's repeat 1 as well. You can see this pingable. You can ping sourcing from loopback 1 as well. And we still have a successful ping. And even we never have to deal with the interface fast 01 on R2, but we just go ahead and ping sourcing from that. We shouldn't really have to come up with any additional translation for that since it's part of the whole IPv4 address space that we have translated to IPv6. You can see we have successful ping here as well. And the IP that's coming in as AC10, which is 172.16, and then C, which is 12, because the subnet right here is 12, and then 2 is obviously the last octet of the interface, which is .2. Okay, so it's automatically translated for us. All right, next let's test. I think the task wants us to test again the DNS ALG feature and make sure it's still working. But currently we have R3. Let's see. Our, let's show run include name. We have it point to the old translation that we have already moved. So we have to remove that and then update to the new IPv6 mapped IP to v4. So that would be IP name 2001.2.2. And for the DNS server, which is 172.16.12.32. So 172.16, we know this AC10. 12 is C. And 32 in hex is 2.0. Okay. So we're trying to ping our 2L0 labminutes.com sourcing from loopback1 you can see that we still have a successful ping so you can see that the DNS ALLG feature is also compatible with IPv4 map feature that we just implemented so any IPv4 embedded 
within the DNS reply will be automatically translated to IPv6. Okay, and now before we could not resolve R2L1 because we did not have an explicit v4, v6 NAT statement, but now that we have the IPv4 map configured, you can see we can ping that as well and it's automatically can, uh, translated to right here 2001.22.101.201. Okay, so you can see that with this particular feature, IPv4 map, it saved us a lot of configuration that we need to do as far as translating IPv4 to IPv6. Okay, so that completes our task number three. So now task number four, NAT PT timeout. So now we're going to need to adjust the NAT translation timeout value to match the following. So that should be pretty straightforward. So we have TCP timeout, fin reset, SYN, UDP, ICMP, and DNS. So to do that on R1, we do config T, IPv6 NAT. And then here we have an option for translation. You can see here, these are all the timeout values or type of timeout that we can adjust. So let's go through this one by one. Let me kind of move that to the side a little bit. There you go. Start out with the TCP timeout. So TCP timeout. You can see the unit is in second, so 600. And then we have fin timeout, 10 second. And sint timeout, 10 second. Uh, UDP timeout. It will be 600 second, and let's see, ICMP is three second, and the last one is DNS, which is two seconds. And we are able to do this because of the, as we saw in the NAT table, when you do show IPv6 NAT translation, the router maintains all the connection states in its NAT table, so it know exactly how long the connection has been up for, or when the connection has like actually timed out. Although we're not going to test the configuration, I just want to show you that it's possible to adjust those values. Okay, so now that we've gone through the NAT PT, the only thing that might be missing when you compare NAT PT to NAT64 is the ability to do a network mapping from V6 to V4, like how we did just now with the V4 to V6 with the IPv4 map. So you're still kind of stuck with whether you want to use a one-to-one -one static NAT, a dynamic NAT, or a PAT for that. Okay, so that should wrap up our video on IPv6 NAT PT. You can visit the website to view an extensive list of our lab videos and sign up to get access to additional lab contents. Thank you for watching labnits.com and I'll see you guys in the next video.